Stephen, hey, how are you doing? Hi, Andy. Good to be here. That's really good to have you here. Um, we're starting our films by asking contributors just to introduce themselves and give us an overview of their work. And I'm especially keen to hear about your latest work. So would you mind doing that, please? Thanks. I'm, my name is Stephen Guy Bray. I'm a professor of English at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, happy Canada Day, by the way. Woohoo! Happy Canada Day. I specialize in uh, Renaissance poetry, queer theory, and poetics. And I published a bunch of stuff. But in next week, uh, my new book will come out hmm. from Rutledge, attractively priced. Uh, and it's called um, Shakespeare and Queer Representation. It's the, the first, I've written other books. This is the first book on a single author I've ever written. So it's sort of a new thing for me. Well, would it be all right to start there then? Um, because yes, I think of you as someone who works across a whole panoply of groovy uh, people. Um, what was it like to train your, your otherwise multi-peopled mind on a single writer and to think about queer representation with just one, just one writer? Well, the project began, it actually began with Shakespeare, with an, uh, an essay I was commissioned to write on Cymbeline hmm. uh, and queer representation. Well, Cymbeline and queerness. And then I was thinking of queer representation and I started thinking of a book and I was in the UK for about a month in November 2017, giving talks, and I was a visiting fellow at Exeter. And I was working on this project, and I originally had plans to do several authors, also to do um, paintings and some contemporary authors. But then two friends of mine, John Garrison and Kyle Pavetti, uh, edit the Spotlight on Shakespeare series at Rutledge. This will be the second book in the series. And they asked me to submit a proposal, and I realized I could do it as a book on Shakespeare. Uh, so it's a somewhat, theoretically, I mean, in terms of the theory, it's much the same project, but the texts are different. I do manage to discuss contemporary poetry in the introduction and in the coda. Uh, I've published on Shakespeare a fair bit over the years, although always only on very early or very late Shakespeare. Mm. Okay. I don't know why that is. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it was a strange experience because I'm not so familiar with the, uh, the, the critical discourse on Shakespeare. And it turns out a lot of people have written on Shakespeare. They really have. They really have. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> it was fine with something like King John because most people don't like King John that much. Uh, but then, you know, I also have a chapter on Macbeth, and boy, howdy, a lot of people have written on Macbeth. So I made the decision early on in the book that I was going to ignore most of what other people had said, because, <laughs> you know, otherwise the book would have been 3,000 pages trying to deal, and it would be just me dealing with the usually wrong things other people have said. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so one of the challenges for this book in particular is that... Um, there's such a, a sustained and pronounced critical discourse, but much of it not necessarily that useful thinking about queer representation, I guess. Um, no. I mean, there's been a lot of queer work on Shakespeare. Hmm. I, I've written some of it myself, but it's tended to focus on uh, queer content. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the fact that the, the two noble kinsmen or the two gentlemen of Verona, um, they seem, at times to be perhaps more than friends. It's a relationship that is in some ways perhaps also a romantic relationship. So that's queerness at the level of, of content. And I wanted to look more at queerness at the level of form. So I looked at the moments at which representation in Shakespeare uh, is emphasized, is dwelt upon in a way that is, that exceeds the function. And I, I was especially, Shakespeare's an interesting case because he was a man of the theater, uh, but as you know, then in the early 1590s, the plays were, the theaters were closed, like now, but fortunately without the bubonic plague. Um, and he wrote these two narrative poems, first Venus and Adonis and then the Rape of Lucrece. And so I started thinking about representation and how if you write plays, you're used to all the things that 
can be represented on stage by actors, by movements, by props, by costumes, by lighting or music, whatever. But <clears throat> if you're writing a poem, you cannot, you don't have that resource. So I was, I was interested in the way Shakespeare seemed to me to be consciously looking at that sort of thing, at the thing, how do I convey that this character is like this or this character is like this? I cannot just have them bring in, you know, an, uh, an actor dressed as an old man or as a young gallant or whatever. I have to describe them. And the Venus and Adonis particularly, that was one of my starting points. He, the metaphors are out of control. So writers often use metaphors, we understand them, you know, my love is like a flame or whatever, a uh, beautiful woman is like a rose, that sort of thing. But he uses so many um, examples that it actually clogs the, the narrative progress of the poem and it becomes distracting as a way of, the metaphors become distracting rather than conveying uh, what he wants to do. Do you want a concrete example? Yeah, great. In the first stanza of Venus and Adonis, there's first there's a reference to the purple-faced sun, which is odd. The sun doesn't have a face, of course, but okay, fair enough, but purple is weird. Then you hear about Adonis, who is rose-cheeked. So we understand it means that he's beautiful and sort of pink and white and so on, uh, but it's not usually applied to men. And then, um, Venus, at the end of the sonnet, is described as a bold-faced suitor. So that's language typically used to describe men, but here it describes Venus. So you have these three references to faces in one little stanza. Um, and you could say that they each, each of the references conveys something about the thing described, which is true. But also, when you think of them together, then it becomes confusing and you're, you start trying to figure them out. Mm -hmm. So. I see that as that's one kind of queer representation, it seems to me. Representation exceeds its function and becomes a thing in itself. Okay. So you might think the end of the, the poem is to tell a story, uh, but the, the metaphors actually slow us down. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I have this image in my head now of Shakespeare writing that stanza with sort of emojis in his head of three different faces. Like Adonis is that slightly embarrassed little face, right? Um, <laughs> and I like the idea of that kind of excess of facial information in the space of a tiny stanza um, as being queer. I'm also struck by your point that quite often people think about queer Shakespeare in relation to two gentlemen of Verona and two noble kinsmen. And I, I like the idea that you need like the number two and then uh, kind of the two, two people of the same gender. But I also wonder if, if the Shakespeare thing is important because um, I spent a bit of time working on Three Ladies of London, which is the earliest surviving play from the Playhouses, and no one's ever suggested there's a threesome possibility there. So I wonder if there's some weird confluence of Shakespeare numbers and then men. Um, I've never thought there. of that. <laughs> I look forward to your uh, forthcoming article on <laughs> the lesbian paradise of the Three Ladies of London. We can all look forward to that. Um, <laughs> Stephen, do you mind if I ask you a very, um, if I bring us back to basics and just ask mm -hmm. what you mean by queer representation? Perhaps we could think about both of those words and what they mean together as well. In, it's, it's funny you should ask. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, to, uh, in the coda, the last section of the book, I say that I've actually avoided giving a really clear, succinct, distinct uh, definition. Yeah of queer representation, and I'm going to end the book by continuing that, that uh, refusal to do so. Um, to me, I bet, you know, basically in a sense, I've, I've already defined it, a queer representation is representation that is important for its own sake, rather than as one of the things that contributes to a narrative, either a narrative in poetry or a, a, the narrative of a play. In the different Shakespeare texts, it, it it assumes different forms. So in Venus and Adonis, I think it's mainly a question of this sort of completely insane proliferation of metaphors and similes, a lot of which are just really weird. Um, so it's it, both, there are lots of them and they're often strange and hard to figure out. Yeah. In Cymbeline, um, which is one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, it's so bizarre. Uh, there's a big emphasis on on the act of describing, you remember the scene where Imogen is sleeping and that dreadful Italian man comes in to write down everything about her room and her so that he can convince 
her husband that they've had sex. Uh, so we actually see representation. He's figuring out how he will represent this scene. And throughout Cymbeline, you have this sort of obsessive focus on bodies and clothes and what they represent. The play keeps returning to that. So that's, their, that's that play's form of queer representation. Um, and then in King John, there's a real focus partly on the face as, as a text that can be read, that can be interpreted, that represents something. Yeah. But there's also this weirdly obsessive focus on texts of all sorts, actual written documents, with the notable exception that everyone comments on of the Magna Carta, mm. the single most famous text of English history, probably, and it doesn't come into King John. King John is odd. Mm. Yeah, King John is odd. And if you don't mind me saying so, that combination of King John, Cymbeline and Macbeth could be described as eccentric or, or odd. I mean, have I got that right? Are, are those the three central those are the three plays? plays. <clears throat> and then the poems as well? Or, Sorry? And, and then the poems as well? Or Yeah, so I do most of the poems. I mean, I have a chapter on Venus and Adonis, one on Lucrece and one on the sonnets. Mm. I chose those three plays. Um, there are lots more that you could do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I refer at one point in the book to Hamlet's speech to the players, which is a pretty good example of this sort of folk, minute focus on representation. Yeah. Um, it's just, it was sort of the luck of the draw. I mean, I was starting with the Cymbeline article that had already been published, so I was revising it. And then I wanted to do Macbeth because I love Macbeth so much. Mm. And then I thought, I think, King John has something to say about queer representation. And I hadn't actually read it at that point in 30 years. Wow. And I went back and I thought, thank you, baby Stephen. It's <laughs> good for that. But when I chose those three, I thought this, this is a really unlikely trio. But then I sort of liked it because you have kind of early, middle, late Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. You also have a play considered one of his best plays, a play considered one of his worst plays, and then a play somewhere in between. So I thought it was a nice range. So nice level of Shakespeare's own career chronology and mm -hmm. also thinking about his reception and the way bits of his work have been canonized as the best thing ever.com and other bits of his canon have been forgotten and not made into that category. Yeah, it's, I mean, the representation of Shakespeare is another great subject. It, King John was once one of his most popular plays. Mm. Uh, and it was, as you probably know, it, the first film of a Shakespeare play is of King John. I did not know uh, that. A silent film made in, I believe, the First World War during that time. I don't mean actually at, in the trenches. Uh, but now yeah, people prefer not to mention it, and you don't, there are not a lot of uh, productions of it. Uh, and that's sort of interesting, too, working with Shakespeare, whom everyone loves, but a play that no one loves. Mm -hmm. I taught King John also in a course I designed called the Minor Renaissance, where we only did works that were considered strange and weird in some way. That was fun. And did, did that course and that teaching influence the research for this book? Yeah, I mean, just the King John chapter, because I wanted to do it. I mean, some of the works in Minor Renaissance are minor for various reasons, but the, the idea of a minor work by a major writer is sort of interesting. Yeah, so the experience of teaching it was very helpful to writing the book. Teaching is generally helpful for writing, I find. Yeah, ditto. Um, so, Stephen, I don't want to invite any plot spoilers, although I know you are yourself a bit suspicious of plot. Um, but do you, would you share with us some of the kind of outcomes of this work and how you now feel about these three plays, these poems, this writer, and queer representation as a result of doing this book? Yeah, I... Well, one result is that I actually became very, very fond of King John, um, yeah. without saying it's a masterpiece or something. Uh, <clears throat> it was an interesting experiment for me to do a single author book. I don't, I haven't transformed myself into a Shakespearean, but it was kind of fun. I hope the book will be useful. Um, because I think that we need to have more discussions of queer theory. Uh, with regard to form, rather than just with regard to content. Yeah. In the distant past, when I was a young person starting out, 
there, there was no clear theory. There was uh, gay and lesbian studies, and that was concerned with things, well, like the two noble kinsmen, things in literature that seemed kind of gay. Also, the biographies of various authors. Uh, and I think that's good work, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done on all kinds of homoerotic tensions in various works over the centuries. Mm. Uh, but I'm actually more interested now in the idea of, of queerness as somehow inhering in form. Mm -hmm. And I think one way it does that is by elevating something like representation, which is one of the tools that writers use in very different ways, depending on whether they're writing a play or a poem, obviously, but still, it elevates it from its status as, as, a, as a supporting mechanism to making it the focus. Uh, there's a sense, I would say, in, in all the works I've discussed in the book, in which representation comes to assume the center of the narrative, often at the expense of the story being told. Uh, and I think that kind of resituating of what the center is and what the periphery is, yeah. is something that, um, can be useful to queer studies generally, I would say. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I'm just um, thinking about, you've, you've said a few times now, this idea of representation, um, kind of displanting, is that the word? Uh, representation getting, getting in the way of uh, taking up the space of narration and that idea of metaphors in, at the beginning of Venus and Adonis, clogging up narrative progress. So. Mm. Um, I can see kind of a million questions I want to ask you now, but, you know, is, is there something straight about narrative that queer form is uh, impeding? Can you tell us a bit more about, about those ideas of, um, of representation uh, re-centering itself at the expense of, of narrative? One of the, uh, when I submitted the proposal, one of the readers, um, the anonymous reviewers, said, that they thought I should define straight representation. And I figured out who that reviewer was. <laughs> so she'll be hearing from me. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a fair question. Um, and I, in the book, I actually decided to use the example of um, Mrs. Stanhope, the Honorable Mrs. Stanhope from Barchester Towers, which is one of my favorite books. Um, she's a very, handsome woman in middle-aged, uh, nice Victorian lady married to a clergyman. And Trollope describes her, her outfit by saying she well knew the importance of decorating a construction and never condescended to construct a decoration. And I thought <laughs> that's straight representation. As it happens in the book, in the novel, Mrs. Stanhope is really just there to be um, the respectable a respectable Victorian matron. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of a model for me of, of straight representation, the idea that there's an actual construction which can be decorated, but the construction is the main thing. Whereas one way to think about queer representation is that it's the construction of a decoration. Mm -hmm. And there might in fact be the construction, and there often is, for instance, the marriage plot, let's say, or in Macbeth, the whole question of who will get to be king of, of Scotland and so on. Yeah but that's not really the main thing. So queer theory then is a kind of, sorry, queer representation is a kind of inversion of the relationship between the construction and the decoration. Okay, yeah, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, and you mentioned earlier this sort of challenge of single author study. Do you feel like this book is a launch pad for thinking about these ideas in relation to other writers from the period or? Is it something specific about Shakespeare? No, I, I think um, I'd prefer to think of it as sort of perhaps modeling a kind of analysis that could be used for other kinds, uh, other poets and, and playwrights as well. Um, I don't think there's anything inherent about Shakespeare's works that makes them more amenable to this kind of analysis. Uh, I think this is something, the idea of queer representation is something that I think can be f used in a lot of studies of a lot of different kinds of works. I, shake, I, mean, I think Shakespeare was a good choice, but um, another great choice, of course, would be Henry James. 
who is, after all, as you know, the greatest novelist in the English language. Um, and what many people don't like about Henry James, because they're stupid, uh, is in fact precisely the difference between the construction and the decoration. Okay. So, I mean, I, I'd be happy to have lots of people use the sort of approaches that I, I demonstrate in, in this book in order to talk about the writers they find most interesting. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, whilst in lockdown, I've been watching a whole bunch of um, movies and I watched um, a 70s German adaptation of um, one of Patricia Highsmith's Ripley novels. Um, mm. The film's called My American Friend. Oh, yeah, uh, I, saw that. I think the book's called Ripley Game. Anyway, that's, that sent me back to reading all of the Ripley novels. And I'd forgotten that the first Ripley novel is obsessed with Henry James's The Ambassadors. So I've now gone back to rereading The Ambassadors. And um, uh, I hear what you're saying, uh, Stephen, but I have to out myself now as one of the stupid people you referred to because the first <laughs> chapter of The Ambassadors, still, even when I'm rereading it, I have no idea what's going on. I am overwhelmed by decoration. <laughs> well, see, the great thing is it's, you, you never have to know what's going on. Yeah. I mean, who cares what happens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you've mentioned um, your, where your work might be going next. And I know, again, that narrative is pretty central to some of the work you're doing at the moment. So do you mind telling us what's happening next for you? Well, I, I'm, I'm starting to work on a new book, which will actually have, I'm sorry, will have nothing to do with narrative. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm just setting up a narrative expectation for you to knock it down so that we can dismiss narrative even as part of this film. <laughs> In the introduction to, to Shakespeare and Queer Representation, I actually write at one point, let other pens dwell on narrative and normativity. So, yeah, I, I, I leave that up to you. Um, <laughs> the next book I want to call The End of the Line, and it will be how on how lines of poetry end. Uh, so rhyme is one way, obviously. Enjambment, where the line both ends and doesn't end. Yeah. And I want to look at the Sistina in particular, which is, there's some great Renaissance examples of it. Um, so I'm interested in how a poem gets from one line to another and how poets choose to focus on that or to try to conceal it. So it's going to be a really sort of technical study of poetics. I mean, of course, you, you should still buy many copies of it, but it, it's very different from this. Um, the similarity between the, the line project and the um, Shakespeare and Career representation project is the focus really on form rather than content. Uh, because, because that's so me, I guess. <laughs> and I suppose um, it would be possible to think about going from one line to another in a poem as a kind of narrative, even if it's a formal narrative, you're still yeah. tracing um, temporal and spatial sequencing, aren't you, or not? Yeah, and I think also, I mean, I think that's a good point because with um, a fixed rhyme scheme, like the English sonnet, um, you know, A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, and so on, that is in itself a kind of narrative in the same way that the marriage plot is or something. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know the order it will happen in, and you know that your, your attention will be directed back and forth and so on. Um, so yes, you can certainly read the form of a poem as part of its narrative. But that's not what you're doing. I might do it a little. Okay, I'll put you in the acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to push you to narrative. I, I, um, I think I share your suspicion of narrative, but uh, uh, I, yeah, I, this idea of form holding up narrative, I think really fascinates me. And the idea of pausing a story or a story becoming overwhelmed by the various vehicles in which people are trying to tell that story, um, mm. I think is really, really exciting. Um, since you mentioned the rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, I have to break out my joke I always make as a teacher, which is that it sounds like a crazy beekeeper who is furiously trying to collect music using 1990s um, forms of uh, music dissemination. That's the end of my joke. That was quite a long and laboured joke. 
Andy, you are such a cornball. <laughs> that is me, I'm afraid, and I apologize. <laughs> so, um, Stephen, as, as a poetry guy, if I may call you that, what was it like hanging out with the very theatrical um, King John? Um, well, in fact, all three of them are kings, aren't they? King John, Macbeth, and Cymbeline. Um, and did that have any particular challenges or opportunities for you as a, someone more used to working with poetry? Well, my, my, my PhD thesis was actually on Marlowe. Um, mm. And I, I've published quite a lot on plays over the years. I mean, you will roll in your grave when I say this, but I think of, a, of the plays as basically just long poems with speech prefixes. <laughs> um, I did with, with, for this book, with each of the, the plays, I did look into um, the history of performances of the play, which was, which was really interesting. Um, most of that didn't make it into the book, though in, with regard to Macbeth, I thought it was, it was interesting to learn that the Weird Sisters were always played by men. Mm. I mean, even long after they were actresses on the English stage, the, the Weird Sisters, until the 19th century, were more likely to be played by men than women. And that's changed. Um, so I did find a lot of the theater history interesting. And of course, most of the criticism of those plays I was reading was written by people whose understanding of the plays is informed by the fact that they go to lots of performances and so on. Um, but yeah, I, I ignored it mainly. <laughs> I was going to deny rolling in my grave, but I absolutely rolled in my grave. And I, I'm just going to retaliate by saying that I think of poetry as, as performances. Uh, so I feel, I feel like we can come at that from two different directions. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I mean, I was wondering that as you were talking about the Venus and Adonis, for example, um, I mean, I'm, I don't know if this will interest you and I apologize if it doesn't, but I'm always interested in the experience of the early modern reader reading that poem or indeed listening to that poem as someone else performs it. Um, and what those three complex metaphors you were talking about at the start, facial metaphors, what those do to the reader or to the listener um, being asked to think about, about faces. Yeah, I think it'd be a terrible idea to read Venus and Adonis out loud. Um, <laughs> partly because of the, the, you know, there's the proliferation of metaphors and similes. There are various inset narratives. I mean, at one point, as you recall, Venus herself says, she stops in the middle of something and says, what, would I, what was I saying? She's completely lost her way in her own story. Mm -hmm. um, the sonnets are different. Um, those are good to, to recite. Um, it, it is really hard to imagine that people could get much out of Venus and listening to Venus and Adonis. So I know it has been staged. Mm, yeah. It was staged, what, 10, 15 years ago in London with puppets. Did I make that up? No, you didn't. No, yeah, 2006. It started up in Stratford-upon-Avon. It's RSC. Um, and then, you're right, moved to London. But, I mean, early, early modern poetry is, as well could function as something you would perform aloud, right, to, to groups of friends. And, and that context itself could, could potentially be queer. Yes. Um, yeah, and Venus and Adonis was always considered sort of scandalously erotic, even though this was the point of the poem, and this is one of Shakespeare's contributions to the story, is that Venus and Adonis never have sex in the poem. The poem's about the not having sex, which, you know, I, I see kind of as a, it's a sort of parallel for the frustration of the narrative, which also is continually impeded. There's always something getting in the way of, of the narrative. I do think that if you, if someone read Venus Adonis out loud, the people listen to it would, they would get occasional beautiful lines, but I don't know how much of the poem they could grasp. And it, in Rape of Lucrece, both Tarquin and Lucrece talk about the possibility that her story will be told. Yeah be recited and so on that, that would be a terrible that would be just a terrible evening um to listen to rape of lucrece it's just it seems to me a fundamentally unsound idea but it is a possibility within the poem my favorite part is when lucrece thinks oh no some a, a nursemaid will tell this story to a, a crying baby and I, that's not how you raise children is it <laughs> you tell them rape stories doesn't seem like a good idea weird to me. Um, 
there was a book a few years ago, and I've completely forgotten the name and the authors. This will be really unhelpful. But it was actually about reading to oneself, reading silently. Um, and it was about, it was connected, as I recall, to the fact that in manuscripts, words became separated as opposed to, you know, just one letter after another until you've gotten to the end of the line. Mm. Um, but it, it was sort of interesting. It was about this switch from poetry as something that someone would read. Right? There's that famous sketch of Chaucer reading Taurus and Crusade to an audience. Um, to poetry as something, then novels, to uh, something that you read silently to yourself. Uh, and I think both Venus and Adonis and Lucrece would work much better read to yourself. Mm. So that, that fascinates me for lots of different reasons, but not least because one of the objections you're raising to reading it loud chime quite nicely with your own research interests in that if the poem is hard to process narratively when you're being read aloud to, but, but it would be easy to spot beautiful lines. Is that not itself quite a queer way of listening by your own definition? Yes, and I've been thinking now, next time I teach Venus and Adonis, I'll, the students will not be allowed to read it. They'll just have to listen yeah. to me reading it and then have <laughs> spot quizzes on it. <laughs> Sorry to say that is how I teach sometimes. Um, not, not at the length of a Venus and Adonis poem, but I do quite like removing text from students' sight and ask them to think about it as a listening experience. Um, and yeah, I wonder, I wonder how Venus and Dennis, how it would work. And as I say, those, those opening references to faces, if you're being presented with a face reading to you and you're surrounded by the faces listening, um, all kinds of things could be going on there. Yeah, I think mean, it is nice to think that they might, someone hearing it read aloud might just sort of pluck out passages they thought were especially beautiful or noteworthy for some reason. And there are a lot of passages like that in Venus and Adonis. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about queerness at the level of, um, of form. I guess I'm struck by how some of these <laughs> texts are themselves fairly queer at the level of, um, of story. And I hesitate to say that now after all the discussion of narrative we've had. But um, The Rape of Lucrece, as you've said, is a poem about, about rape. But, but Venus and Adonis is also potentially a poem about rape in that you have an incredibly powerful, divine, supernatural character who will not take no for an answer. Um, you've also got in strong enough to lift him off his horse, right? You've also got in Macbeth a character, well, Macbeth himself. He goes off stage describing his journey to go and murder um, Duncan in terms of Tarquin going off to to rape Lucrece. So there are some kind of um, there are odd representations of sex and sexuality in these various texts. Um, yeah, Macbeth is very strange because. I mean, Lady Macbeth, before she wimps out, but at the beginning of the play, she's always saying, I want to be a man so I can kill people. And also, my husband is a total girl, and I have to get him to be stronger and tougher. And then you uh, have the weird... Just for the benefit of our listeners, these are direct quotations uh, from yes. Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then the weird sisters themselves are somewhere between genders hmm. or somewhere beyond gender. Uh, so that's true of that play um, very much. And yeah, in Venus and Adonis, it's, she's trying to seduce him, but there's also the very real threat that she will actually rape him, although it never comes to that. And what a lot of people writing about that poem have wondered is, which is a good question, why does Adonis not want to sleep with Venus? Everyone wants to have sex with Venus, right? She's the most beautiful woman in the world. So what are options? What are our options for thinking about this? Um, and the one I like best is that Adonis is actually asexual. He's hmm. someone who doesn't have sexual interest, or at least not at this point in his life. Um, so it's a very interesting representation of on the one hand, a man who appears to have no sexuality, and on the other hand, a woman, or at least a, a goddess, who only has sexuality. That's her whole reason for being. That's fascinating, Stephen. I've managed to get through um, almost 50 a bit lit films now without mentioning John Lilly, but I might have to do it now, and I apologize. But, but you're making me think about uh, a play by John Lilly called Sappho and Theo, um, in which Venus is a character, and I, you're, I'm almost wondering if that might be a kind of a backstory for Shakespeare's poem, but yeah, the, there Venus is both 
unbelievably beautiful, but also going through a midlife crisis and very worried that she's far too wrinkled to be attractive anymore. Um, and there too, she falls in love with the most beautiful boy on earth. In fact, she makes him the most beautiful boy on earth with some sort of magical um, do-over. You know, she gives him a-, a I think that was her first mistake. <laughs> what, the makeover? Yeah. Yeah, well, she does that and then falls in love with him. But um, yeah, um, there may be some interesting kind of relationships between those two texts that I have to confess I've never thought about before. But that play itself is, a, is very interested in Sappho and Sappho's sexuality and Sappho's connection to the women around her. So um, I'm sorry, this, this isn't a very useful comment for you, but it's making me think about dialogue I might be thinking about between those two, uh, those two texts. But yeah, but once you finish... Once you finish the essay on the lesbian utopia that is the Three Ladies of London, you can get to work on this one. I like that play by Lily very much. I'd never actually thought of the connection, mm. which I will think about that too and look forward to your article. Yeah, Venus is a hub for queer, queer thinking. And um, again, that play ends by renouncing narrative and saying, we haven't got anywhere at the end of this play. Nothing has changed is the message of the epilogue. Although that's not actually true, but it ends with, again, this kind of hyper-representative queerness um, that we've got nowhere. Lily's um, weird. Lily's weird. Yes. Yeah. Hey, look, let's end on that statement. Lily is weird. Um, <laughs> Stephen, is there anything else um, I should be asking you about or you'd like to tell us about in connection to your book, which is out next week, very excitingly? Uh, now, the cover's very pretty. <laughs> oh, all the roses. Um, no, nothing I can think of. Well, for people watching, we'll put a link um, underneath this video on our website um, for you to access Stephen's new book. Keep a lookout too for The End of the Line, which is, uh, it sounds like the exciting um, sequel. Um, Stephen, we end these films by asking contributors what the word literature means to them, where it sits in their, either their personal or their professional vocabulary. I realise I didn't warn you about this question, so I apologise. But um, do you have any thoughts about where, what, the, what the word literature means for you? Andy, as you, as you should know by now, I have thoughts about everything. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, don't get me started. One thing literature means to me, is, of course, is on the practical level, I'm a professor of English literature. Uh, <clears throat> but in a broader sense, I would say literature is aesthetically ambitious art made out of words. Mm. Oh, that's good. Yes, it is. I'm so glad this is being recorded so I can quote myself later. <laughs> um, yeah. And there, I mean, there are many kinds of, of literature and so on. Poetry is the kind I'm most concerned with, but I think that probably applies to all of them. I love it. Thank you. I don't think we should say anything more. Uh, Lily is weird and literature is aesthetically ambitious art made out of words. That's great. <laughs> um, happy Canada Day to you and your fellow Canadians. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for this film. Thanks for the interview. <laughs> Take care.